All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Todd Vision. I'm the uh, chair of the board of directors for Dryad, and I'd like to welcome you to the annual meeting. We uh, we have this every year, and uh, we often um, also have a community meeting uh, in which we talk about emerging issues. Um, we're going to be doing uh, that again in the, in the fall um, or late summer. And uh, so today, uh, relatively short, we'll we'll have a bit of a, a member meeting, um, uh, sort of a business meeting from uh, our executive director, Meredith Moravati, and then we'll hear about uh, the data life cycle. We'll talk about a couple examples from different domains, um, one in sort of the... Um, uh, sensitive data, human subjects data, uh, where there's all sorts of interesting issues with respect to data curation. And uh, then uh, we have um, Andrew Hufton from the uh, Scientific Data Managing Editor uh, talk to us about a case of a really interesting data set that uh, came through in a data publication in, in their journal. And uh, we'll talk about the process of uh, getting that published and uh, the reuse of that and sort of use it as a launching point uh, for you all to ask questions um, uh, about the, the processes of data publication uh, writ large. So we want to look at the data life cycle as a um, kind of integrated whole from the researchers uh, work on it through to publication to post-publication and any questions on that um, whole cycle are, are up for grabs. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over um, to uh, Meredith Moravati, and uh, just mention we have a, a chat window here that you're welcome to um, post questions or comments uh, and have a thread going. We'll kind of monitor that as it's uh, going, and then I'll ask um, questions that pop up from the chat uh, to the speakers. So if you have a question for them, that's the way to, to get it in. Um, we'll have questions after the member, after the business meeting. Um, and then after each of the two different uh, data lifecycle cases. So, um, and then we'll, we'll leave time at the end, hopefully, for, um, uh, for additional discussion. And uh, we'll try to wrap up by um, uh, within an hour. So with that, um, take it away. Thank you, Todd. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. And especially a thank you to Dryad members who are an important partner in our work to provide infrastructure and services around making data more open and accessible. I'm the executive director of Dryad, as um, Todd introduced me, and I, and I have a background in association management, member outreach, and publishing. And I've been focusing a lot this past year on sustainability goals on behalf of Dryad. And so I'm going to take a little time today to talk about Dryad as an organization, and I will also go over some essential pieces of planning for data that we see, starting with policy, and describe a bit about how Dryad works as a nonprofit. I'll then briefly describe how the data submission system works, including curation of data, and end on some cool accomplishments this year, after which we will go into the panel topics, as Todd um, outlined. And just to reiterate some of the technical matters, just to make sure you're familiar with how to participate, as Todd mentioned, we do have this chat session on the left hand of the screen, um, and we'll be monitoring that throughout, and we'll be stopping for Q&A periods. Um, I also wanted to point out a feature for those that are joining us today that wish to take notes during the presentation. When you click on the Notes tab on the right-hand side of your screen, you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's talk. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the presentation. In addition, if you're interested in a PDF copy of the PowerPoint slides or would like to download any of the information referenced, including the annual report, you can click on the Resources tab on the left-hand side of the player and then click any of those file names to initiate that download. These will also be emailed to you at the end of the presentation. And lastly, if you experience any technical problems or issues during the course of the webinar, you can click on the Request support button on the lower left of the player. And we have a technical expert that's available um, there to help with any problems you might have. So to get started, I'd like to highlight a few examples of data that do not have a natural home of their own and without the kind of infrastructure that Dryad provides could be lost. These data are not supported 
naturally by a community repository or a specialized repository. But they're comprised of various file types and non-standard information images, et cetera. And they hold they still hold important information to support paper and for future analysis. These are future data. These are regular tweets that we send out that highlight the breadth of data that we've seen in Dryad, promote data publishing and reuse, and contribute to conversations online. The one on the left is from the Royal Society. It's a study on urban sounds and related social media posts to map out possible relations between sound and emotion. And the data set on the right is also a study that collects social network data. This time it's around a disaster event, Hurricane Sandy. And this study was in PLOS and looks specifically at disaster awareness and makes recommendations on possible improvements for recovery and for planning. Data sets such as these can be very useful for government and urban planning as well as policy development in a variety of zoning disaster events. And additionally, social media data, data sometimes um, needs an extra hand in curation to make sure they are appropriate for um, open access. So the, the origin of data was policy, and policy is an important starting point when institutions begin to support data. The Joint Data Archiving Policy, which is shown here, was adopted by about a dozen editors who led the field in evolution and life science. And this in itself is very innovative, that a group of editors of a variety of different journals came together, and they together formed an agreement that data are important products of research, that data should be deposited in an appropriate public archive, but they allow for embargoes and special consideration. This policy was effective in part because it's high-level, basic, and concise, so it's a natural starting point. So later now we can look at this policy as an example of how to get started with your policy or possibly how to improve it to encourage publishers or editors, for instance, to make sure that their data policy covers all data and not that of a particular type and to think about ways to make policy more effective, easier to digest by your authors and more impactful. So how effective was this policy? Well, this um, image is taken from a study of phylogenetic data to see how availability was impacted by this JDAP policy and compare it to the National Science Foundation's policy requiring data management plans that were, they were both introduced at the same time. The vertical axis shows the proportion of data that was available from the articles, and that's on the right side of the screen, published between the years of 2002 and 2014, which is shown along the horizontal. Then the first block illustrates that when papers were funded by the National Science Foundation but were published in journals without JDAP, there was a minor increase in availability after 2011. Contrast this with the middle block. When papers were published in a journal that put JDAP into practice, even if they were not funded by NSF, this post-policy increase was very impressive. The availability of data increased from less than 10% to over 80% in a few short years. So what made the difference here was good, clear policy and infrastructure to support it. In these cases, the infrastructure was mainly Dryad and other specialized repositories. So this lovely slide shows our international representation of Dryad in our board of directors. A key takeaway here is that Dryad is a nonprofit organization and we are governed by individuals from a variety of institutions with a variety of expertise and backgrounds. Our board members do not um, represent their organizations, but they serve as individuals. And this nonprofit model is, in general, one of stakeholders rather than shareholders. Dryad's vision is to promote a world where research data is openly available, integrated with scholarly literature, and routinely reused to create knowledge. And our mission is to provide the infrastructure for and to promote the reuse of data underlying scholarly literature. And as a membership organization, Dryad owes a debt of thanks to our body of members. Members may receive discounts on data publication charges, they vote on board nominations and bylaws, and they help guide and shape the organization and the future of research and access to that research. We are grateful for our members, and we thank you very much for your support and participation. 
Participation in Dryad is open to all organizations, and there are a variety of ways you can get involved. You can join Dryad as a member. Members provide financial support with dues, as well as governance support with their votes. Members receive recognition on slides and multiple talks through the year, as well as on our website, highlighted as a supporter of quality data. And they're also invited to participate in meetings and collaborate in events such as these today and ones in the future. Another way to participate is integration. You can integrate your journal with, with our system. It allows for easy data support for files that do not have a natural home, and it takes advantage of the setup of a variety of manuscript submission systems. A third way is to choose to support data publication charges. Our sponsors are organizations who are committed to making it easy and affordable for their community to publish data. So how does Dryad work? How do we accomplish supporting that, that data? Well, Dryad has integrated now with 107 journals, and this um, slide shows one workflow. This is the first that we had that took data after the article had been accepted and was on its way to being published. Now, however, we have two more workflows that allow you to have data during review. The options are still easy. With Dryad submission integration, there is metadata exchange between the repository and the journal. And this exchange has a variety of technical options. You can do this by email or API. You can choose what suits you. It, regardless of your choice, it ensures bi-directional linking of the article and data. And the end result is an article with its Crossref DOI linked to a data set with its data site DOI. And the benefits here are simple data deposition that frees the author from providing and retyping detailed metadata. It's all provided accurately and automatically. Links are created and will resolve according to what the journal's preferences are, and they'll permanently point to each article. And data can be used during the review process by providing anonymous and private access. The ability to support a variety of journal policies, such as embargo options, is important. And integration is open to scientific and medical publications. It's not just open to partners or to members. So what is the magic that happens to the data once Dryad receives it? We'll talk a little more about this in the panel set at the end of the section. And we'll have a Dryad curator, Rebecca, will describe some of her process. But for now, let me just say that our curators really are wizards behind the curtain. They are an essential and helpful part of the infrastructure that provide quick customer assistance, data checks, and work to ensure quality control and submissions, ensuring data are available for discovery and reuse in the future. And this blog post will go into more detail about what our curators do. Now, to moving on to the accomplishments we've had this year. We at Dryad are super excited to welcome new partners and increase participation for current partners. 18 new journal, journals integrated their manuscript submission system with the Dryad data submission process just last year, and we started a pilot project to test the ease of charging a funder directly for data charges. Content in Dryad is broadening and shows us that our lessons learned on making data open in evolution in life science and similar fields are now being applied to a larger variety of data. Looking at our most popular data sets in terms of downloads from last year, this is really supported. So among the top five downloads, there is data on plant genetics, there's early history of race and fishes, but also major interest was the data set of social media data from Sci-Hub and data from one of the top five journals in, call in cardiology. So in spite of the current threat to the continued accessibility of research data, more open data is being published than ever before. The data on the left is the Sci-Hub data that was one of our most popular data sets in terms of downloads for 2016. And the one on the right is from a, talk, from a data paper for scientific data and will be featured in a little more detail later in this talk. In 2016, one of our big projects was to pilot a way to enable a funding agency directly to sponsor data publication charges. And we tested the workflow of asking for grant metadata, managing payments, and tested the amount of data we got under this pilot. An important part of the pilot was also to survey partners and researchers on their perspective, and we got a lot of really interesting information. We surveyed uh, 1,300 researchers 
and out of those got responses from 317 who pay the data publication charge on their own to get a better understanding of their challenges when asking for reimbursement, finding funds, and so forth. So this slide is from researchers who submitted data management plan as part of their project with the NSF. And what we found was that although almost half of them had committed to archiving data as part of that plan, you can see that in the first graph, almost none of them actually budgeted for archiving data, and quite a few, 41%, archived the data after the grant period ended. So these factors suggest that if funding agencies really need to prioritize supporting data stewardship, they should make funds available for this purpose outside the traditional grant structure. Our exciting announcement today is a new partnership between Dryad and Dons. Dons will now be a long-term successor data archive for all published data in Dryad. This will allow all our users, partners, authors, all the confidence that Dryad content is secure in the long term. Dons, or the Data Archiving and Network Services, promotes sustained access to legal to digital research data. Dons ensures that the access to the digital research data keeps improving, and it is an institute of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research. So through this partnership, Dryad authors, users, and partners can be assured that long-term global access to the scholarly outputs will be maintained, and Dons will further enhance its data holdings and support its mission to promote sustained stewardship of digital research data. That does it for the Dryad overview of the business meeting. We might have a few minutes uh, before we get started in the panel. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat window or let us know if you have any before we move on. All right. Thank you, Meredith. Yes. Uh, so please uh, paste any questions you have into the, into the chat or uh, communicate them outside of chat while you... I think one one common question that that comes up, Meredith, is um, uh, who is eligible for um, submission integration? Uh, how does that interact with membership or sponsorship? Sure, sure. So Dryad is a nonprofit organization, and as such, we do encourage organizations to join as a member. However, membership is not required, um, and data publication charge sponsorship is not required to set up an integration between journal and Dryad submission system. Um, we don't have any requirement on that side. We encourage journals to integrate with Dryad and consider paying for data publication charges. We would always welcome new members, but it's uh, not something that's needed in order to set up the technical exchange of metadata. So we're going to start here with um, Rebecca Kameny, who is the, a Dryad curator and community liaison. She's going to use an example of a date Dryad data set when talking about preparation for human subjects data for open access. Uh, we'll take a short break after that to answer any questions that come up about this topic, and then we'll move on to talk about snapshot Serengeti, starting with Andrew Hupton from Scientific Data, and then I'll do some um, examples of reuse at the end. So, Rebecca, take it away. Okay. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. I really appreciate it. My name is Rebecca Kameny. Um, as Meredith said, I am a curator and a community liaison for Dryad. Uh, I'm going to be talking about human subjects data today. First, I'll give you a brief introduction to what researchers and curators need to consider when they prepare these kinds of data for open access. And then I'll talk you through a case study just to illustrate some of these issues that come up and also illustrate the communication that takes place behind the scenes between the curator and the researcher. So uh, we need to consider some of the critical issues and sometimes competing interests of human subjects protection and open data. Uh, as you know, there are ethical and legal regulations, both here in the U.S., U.K., Europe, and elsewhere, that protect anonymity of research subjects involving issues such as uh, privacy, uh, expectations of privacy, confidentiality, consent, things like that. On the other hand, the purpose of open data is transparency and, of course, reuse. Uh, what this means is that researchers and curators need to take extra care when they are preparing human subjects data for open access. Right in the outset, I'm just going to say there is no full consensus at the moment on what constitutes proper preparation of these kind of data for open access, and it is an ongoing discussion among the stakeholders. 
The goal here, however, is to limit identifying information, preserve participants' anonymity, which is assured during the consent process, and this identifying information can be either direct or indirect, and both of these need to be taken into account. Uh, there is some consensus around direct identifiers, which are generally not allowed at all in an open data set. Some of these direct identifiers are obvious, uh, name, address, uh, social security number, things like that. And uh, just as an aside, uh, they may seem obvious, but it's not that unusual to see them in a data set. And even last week, I had a data set that had uh, full first name, middle, and last names of every research participant, so I had to send that one back. Uh, other direct identifiers that researchers might not know about are initials of participants, uh, audio recordings of their voices, those are not allowed, uh, dates related to an individual are not allowed, and even fMRIs, if they show facial contours, are not allowed. Now, indirect identifiers are not so clear. So, the NIH says that, here's a, you're looking at some of these indirect identifiers here on this slide. Uh, so NIH states that researchers should consider removing indirect identifiers and other information that could lead to deductive disclosure of participants' identities. Deductive disclosure of individual subjects becomes more likely when there are unusual characteristics or joint occurrence of several variables. Samples drawn from small geographic areas, rare populations, linked data sets, etc., can present particular challenges to the protection of human subjects. So some of the examples here, age, gender, you see that a lot, of course, occupation, even name of someone's doctor, risky behaviors such as drug use, uh, number of children, sensitive data such as HIV status. So while one or two of these identifiers might be okay, if you add a third, it might be too easy to identify someone. Or if you have a small participant pool, then maybe even two indirects are not okay. So let's go to the case study. This is a study of effectiveness of a suicide prevention program for indigenous youth. The first author, Joe Teague, submitted his data set earlier this year, and I was a curator for this data package, so I looked at the title, and it alerted me to some possible human subjects issues. Uh, the first was the word suicide. That's considered sensitive data, as you can imagine. Indigenous is another word. That is a vulnerable population and you need to take extra measure to ensure anonymity. Youth as well is considered a vulnerable population. So in addition to these three words, uh, you also see randomized controlled trial there, which tells me that it's going to be uh, probably individual level data. Okay, so I looked at the original data set, and the first look shows me that it's mostly measurements, measurement scores from depression scales and behavior scales. <laughs> and there are no direct identifiers. So, so far, so good. Uh, however, I did see several indirect identifiers, uh, such as age, uh, schizophrenia diagnosis, uh, relationship status, education, things like that. Also note that the participant pool is quite small, 62. Um, and when I sorted by age, which I tend to do when I see a data set that's relatively small or has other issues, uh, if I sorted by age, I did see some unique values. Uh, in other words, there'd be like one person who was 13 years old, things like that, which might make it easier to identify. Also in this data set were, was an open-ended comment box. Those are, uh, you need to be careful with those because anything can be in them. And there can be names of the participants in there, I've seen that, or names of relatives, things like that. In this case, this was a comment box for researchers, and I saw some uh, specific locations listed. So, with a small number of participants and a vulnerable population and sensitive data, I sent this back to the researcher with a little guidance and a couple of suggestions. And here's the path that we took as far as communication goes. First round of communication, I uh, suggested that he limit the indirect and pointed him to some guidelines one of which was an FAQ that we have on Dryad, and the other is a BMJ Open article, which has really good, really good guidelines. And I asked him to review those and then resubmit. He then returned them to me, and he had indeed deleted some indirects and deleted the comments entirely. 
but there were still too many indirect identifiers at this point. So in the second round, I asked him to take another look and see if he could do more to limit the identifying information because of all the issues we talked about already. He needed to take extra care with this data set. I did give him specific suggestions. I lifted his indirect identifiers that were still there and provided him with some options, which included things like removing any variables that he didn't use in his analyses, collapse variables into categories. This would be good to do for age, for example. It also um, top or bottom code to eliminate outliers or mask variables in various ways. <clears throat> so the result of the second round was successful. Uh, we had a clean data set with fewer indirect identifiers. He actually removed age uh, and no open-ended text, and so I archived it. Some data sets can take a little bit more, like maybe three rounds, but the vast majority of human subjects' data at Dryad do get archived. And I do want to make a note here that the curators uh, are not making these decisions in a vacuum. We involve not only the researchers, but loop and journal editors as needed and base our decision on their policy. We also actually enjoy working with researchers to get their data out there. And the conversation is ongoing, as I mentioned earlier. Everyone's involved in it. Funders and publishers develop their open access policies, sometimes have specific uh, human subjects guidelines. There are conferences on open science, open data, and Dryad is sharing our experience as well. Uh, the last few slides, I list uh, a couple of papers that Dryad staff have written, one on curation and one on sharing social media data, which is a new area. There's a recent uh, blog, actually today, on PLOS One about uh, data sharing, which is really interesting. I don't have quite have that uh, citation, but I could get it for you. And there are some more links uh, in the next few slides. So everyone's focused on the same goal here. It's to protect the privacy of human participants, while at the same time opening up access to data to promote transparency and reuse. And that's all I've got, if there's questions. All right, if any uh, questions, please add them to the, the chat. Um, one question that came up, uh, Rebecca, is is, uh, is is it always clear what's a direct versus a, an indirect identifier? Are there cases where that changes based on context? Mm, that's a good question. I think the definition of direct in identifiers has changed and does differ between um, where you look, uh, so you could look at NIH might have something different, and if you look in the um, the um, links that I have at the bottom, there are several places that are separate guidelines, and they may differ, but um, there's a pretty good consensus on direct identifiers. It's the indirects where there's a lot of subjectivity, and it also it really does depend on the nature of the study itself. Are there, uh, are there cases where um, the full non-anonymized data is uh, available in conjunction with the, the more public anonymized data, Dryad, that, that you've curated, where you've had to kind of interact with I think, to encourage the sort of availability of the full sensitive data set? You mean the full non-anonymized data set available? Right, sort of a gated access from an institution I... or from a... I personally have not, but you know, mm -hmm. as you know, I've just been a dryad, you know, not mm -hmm. super long, and it, I bet our our head curators have definitely looped, had to deal with that issue. Yeah. All right, we have a, a question in the chat. Uh, is there a sense that it's much more difficult to eliminate direct or indirect mm -hmm. identifiers in social media or big data? Um, heard this concern many times, for instance, about geolocation data. Yeah, I know something about the social media data um, because we're getting that, and I and uh, have not dealt with the big data, but I agree with that. Social media, there's we definitely we have a paper out on that uh, written by Elizabeth Hull, and um, I know there's issues with the location, with the expectation of there's an issue with expectation of privacy where where they don't. Ex they, their Twitter, if it's Twitter or whatever, they don't necessarily expect it to be showing up in, you know, research and things like that. So that is a really new area, and um, 
And I do have a couple of links on, on the slides that will help uh, review that. I think the Sci-Hub data is actually a good example of that. Um, the, uh, okay. I believe they, yeah. they, they had, uh, they had uh, what would be the word, vagified the uh, locations <laughs> to the nearest town. It did. Which which works so, which works if you're in a large town, but uh, I think the issue is you know whether um, whether a small number of researchers who might be using SciHub in a small um, settlement might be make it almost identifiable. So yeah, right. that's definitely an yeah, issue. Yeah, and that's why it's so dependent on what the study actually is and how many mm -hmm. people are in the study. You know, if it's millions, right. it's very different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's wrap that up. Thanks a lot, Rebecca. Um, and I'll turn back to you, Meredith, to introduce the next part of the panel. Okay. Um, great. Well, thank you, Rebecca, and for the question. Uh, so the next part of the panel, we're going to start with, um, with Andrew Hupton from um, Scientific Data. And he'll speak a little bit about um, a really cool data set called Snapshot Serengeti and the data paper in Scientific Data. And then before taking questions, we're going to move right on to my section where I'll talk a little bit about the data reuse cases that we've seen. And uh, we'll take questions sort of in a group after this. Um, so um, Andrew, Hustin, take it away. Thanks, Meredith. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to speak about this manuscript because it was a lot of fun um, to handle at Scientific Data. For people that don't know me, um, my name is Andrew Hupton. I'm the managing editor of Scientific Data. Scientific Data is a, a data journal at the Nature Research Group, and we publish essentially descriptions of data sets. Um, so our articles are, are designed to promote data reuse and not necessarily interpretation, and, and that makes you know a very natural fit, um, obviously, with the mission of Dryad. And Dryad remains by far one of the most popular um, repositories that our authors select. So we we, we we work with a lot of different repositories and try to help our authors find one, and, and um, you know we always enjoy working with Dryad. So this specific this specific manuscript um, is on a project called Snapshot Serengeti, and so these authors deployed 225 camera traps um, in Serengeti National Park um, over the course of about three years, um, and you know these are designed to, to trigger any time a relatively large animal walks past. Um, uh, large being, you know, anything from a, a badger to, you know, a uh, wildebeest. Um, and they captured 1.2 million image sets. They're image sets because the camera flashes two or three times when triggered. Um, and animal presence was then scored through a public web portal by thousands of citizen science scientists. So it was kind of, you know, gamified. You, um, you got to see these images and then score them and then um, they had experts then that did their own scoring so that they were allowed to validate these sort of citizen science annotations both against a gold standard and cross-validation in terms of you know, consensus from the citizen scientists. So a really exciting data set and a really challenging data set to share. Um, and so these authors um, came to us and, and were, um, we were quite excited about the uh, possibility to peer review and publish this. Um, and so we worked with them um, um, to, to um, peer review and, and get the data hosted. Um, I want to show you a little bit about the article as well. So the article itself wraps around the data set. It describes the methods in a lot of detail. And what you can see here in the right-hand column is a list of the different sections in a data descriptor. You can see that there's no results section. There's a whole section on data records and on validation and on usage. And that's a real opportunity to really describe what's at Dryad. And then that the data record at Dryad is formally cited um, with a formal data citation. And there's an example there at the bottom, and that then links directly to the data record at Dryad. So it's very easy to go between the article and the record at Dryad. Um, and so, yeah, we worked with the authors then to host and, and peer review this data, which was quite a challenge. So there's actually a couple different levels to the data. Um, so at Dryad, you have essentially the annotation data. So this is the raw crowdsourced animal presence annotation, the expert annotations, um, as well as the consensus analysis on that, and the camera operation dates, and the image metadata for all 1.2 million image data sets. And all of this is released, of course, 
CC0. So there's just an example of the, the gold standard data set and, and what it looks like when you open it in a text editor right out of Dryad. But the underlying images, of course, are, are, are many terabytes of data. So um, we worked with the authors, and so they have this hosted actually in Amazon S3, which um, we felt was a reasonable compromise in this case. So a link to every single one of these images is included in the Dryad record. So you can basically use the Dryad um, data record as an index to each of these data files. So there's an example of one of the images and the link that you can generate into S3. Now, you know, we thought this was a good compromise. In the future, we would like to be able to host all of these kinds of things as well in, in DUI issuing archives. But, you know, we make compromises, we work with our authors, we find the right solution. Um, and so you can probably see the zebra there in the corner of that picture. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of really amazing pictures captured in the course of this, this um, project. These are just a few examples. Uh, and, of course, this made for, you know, just an amazing publication um, in terms of the media response and, and, you know, the coverage that we got. You had familiar animals. You had great pictures. You had a powerful citizen science story. And the authors were actually also quite engaged. Um, and this led to coverage in many top papers across several different languages. And I have to say, you know, this is maybe one of, one of these roles that data journals can play. We have access to a professional press team. Um, that they, you know, the Nature Press team does a really great job and really helped, you know, get this out there in the right way. But there was also a lot of synergy there with Dryad. So we actually wrote, um, uh, there's a, a, um, a blog post um, there you can see there at the bottom, posted by Todd, um, in uh, the Dryad uh, News and Views uh, blog site, and we then co-posted, um, cross-posted that as well at Scientific Data. So, the, you know, you had promotion from many different angles here, and I thought that, in this case, that worked really, really well. Um, so that's the overview I want to give, and Meredith is then going to give you some, some um, overviews of some of the ways that this pretty amazing data set has actually been used so far, uh, just a year down, down the line. Great. Thanks very much, um, Andrew. And folks, if you have questions for Andrew, you can feel free to put them in the chat window. If they're clarifying, we can certainly stop and answer them, but then uh, it might be effective just to kind of summarize all these questions at the end. I'll, I'll just be talking a little bit about um, the reuse that we have seen so far come out of this really rich um, data set and data paper. Um, so thanks very much for your description, Andrew, of this really interesting data paper. And um, I'm going to focus on these various outputs and uh, show you some examples of, of the reuse. So this original um, data set, Snapshot Serengeti, um, uh, we said, I think, yeah, 28,000 members of the public made over 10 million classifications of animal photos from a couple hundred camera traps in the Serengeti National Park. And the focus here was on citizen science and classification for the most part. Now, uh, this article, this image on the left here, in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society B, called The Spatial Distribution of African Savannah Herbivores by T. Michael Anderson, was a result of an early collaboration uh, with Swanson and the group that put Snapshot Serengeti together and was a known research project when um, Snapshot Serengeti came out. By publishing the data paper and data, Swanson was able to quickly get out a very important data set and focus on her interest and gain credit for this work. And further studies, such as this one, didn't have to slow down or hold up that process. So there's a large amount of collaboration surrounding this project, and in, in, mostly in the areas of citizen science and in the areas of ecology. And the group were essentially able to plan their collaboration, and they were able to anticipate a lot of reuse. Um, Swanson, for instance, is the co-author on this, partic this particular paper, and Anderson is also working with other researchers on other projects. So the collaborators knew that, the, that Anderson would be an output, and they could easily anticipate similar studies in ecology, such as community ecology. In fact, Anderson, along with another co-author, Craig Packer, have been awarded funds for more study along these lines of community ecology. And presumably, the public availability of the data paper was instrumental in securing their new projects. And some of these, if not all, were known to the original group of collaborators who divvied up the work in terms of fields and interest. So Swanson and her team would focus on citizen science, Anderson and Packer will focus on ecology. 
But since this data set has images, classifications, dates, time, location data, it was also anticipated that there would be a lot of computer visualization research to come out of this. And in such a short time, we've already seen some research on machine learning where computer visualization is trying to essentially beat the accuracy of the classifications of the citizen science project. So you can see an image from one such study on the bottom of the slide. It's a little small. But you can see that where machine learning is essentially trying to improve on images by classifying them, especially images that are obscured or classified incorrectly and so forth. So Swanson and the team also knew of some educational work that would come out of such a really rich data set. In fact, Swanson's institution planned on using this data set to provide students uh, the ability to work with such a big data set and to make their own analysis. And this is a newish educational opportunity. Um, and we found a few others uh, as well that were not known uh, to the original team. Now, these educational uses do not generally follow the paper, um, publishing paper citation um, traditional format. So, therefore, they can be somewhat difficult to identify. So, um, it's reasonable to assume that there's going to be even more of those that will come out of such a rich data set. So, it's also important to consider this paper by Anderson and their vision of future studies as well. So you can begin to imagine the ongoing work that will come out of making data open. The Swanson data set will have multiple uses, we know that, and we've seen some, but each other study can and likely will spur on more and more into other areas. For example, Anderson plans to combine this data with another data set of NASA satellite images to see changes in patterns. And even more interesting is watching the data impact fields outside areas that the original collaborators anticipated. For example, when we spoke to him, Anderson suggested that in the fields of statistical theory, there will be a reuse of these data and parallel research that will be published in the statistics community's journals to further the field of statistics, to test models, and so forth. So we'll be um, uh, excited to watch those come out as well. So what other reuse is happening with this open data set, this rich set? Now that we have such a large amount of these data, what kind of things will come out of it? Well, we talked about analysis for closed communities and for some that are not so close. But that's not where it stopped. In a few short years, we've also seen discussions open around standards of camera trap data. Discussions are happening around how making this data more findable more accessible, interoperable, and reusable. What kinds of formats are needed? What kind of descriptors are needed? What are the appropriate ontologies and so forth? So this can be really, really transformative, that by making this data open, publishing the data paper with all the information you need to use the research in a variety of ways, we'll get more and more research in many fields, and we may also support progressive movements in communities to make data more fair in general. Standards around data preservation are not readily available in all communities. So once you have a large amount of certain types of data, discussions start to happen and progressive movements to making data more accessible um, begin. And we are really excited to support and see that happening. So this is what we want to happen. And the examples of the data paper is, of course, a little different from a more traditional paper. But it does give us the opportunity to consider the best way to craft collaboration so that each group can have appropriate outputs and focus on their interests. In this case, Swanson was able to focus on the data collection and citizen science classification and collaborate on other outputs. Anderson and Parker worked on community ecology, and we expect to see statistician, statistician groups involved turn out some modeling projects as well. Anticipated reuse in terms of machine learning will surely continue, and early discussions of standards needed for metadata and ontologies in this field and formats and so forth are going to be interesting to watch and probably will transform the way communities manage these kind of data. Anderson, interestingly, is now managing the Serengeti project, and new data sets that, will, that emerge will continue to be made open. 
In a few short years, we've seen broad interdisciplinary use of these data, and communities will continue to inform themselves and general repositories like Dryad about the best ways to make these data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. This is the way we want this to happen, and it's really an open data success story, which I expect to continue. So that was the summary I wanted to go over with some reuse cases. I appreciate everybody joining us for this talk today and the panel pieces. Um, and I'd love to take time uh, for any questions. If any of you all have questions for Rebecca in terms of making sensitive data open, or Andrew in terms of the data package and the decisions they had to make surrounding um, servicing that data, and, um, and also about the reuse cases and so forth. So again, if you have questions, please go ahead and put it in the chat room on the left-hand side of your screen. Great, thank you, Meredith. Let me let me start off with a question for Andrew. So, what scientific data is uh, planned in terms of tracking data reuse? So, where do you think the, the um, uh, technology will allow this to be done? Uh, you, Meredith had mentioned some difficulties in tracking things that aren't traditional publications and so on. Yeah, I think that this is, um, I don't have a good answer to that, but I, I think that there's been some recent things that I've seen, uh, you know, and that I don't have the solution yet in front of us. Um, but I think the need for tracking is, is, if possible, it's just become even more evident to me. I think there's a recent uh, very cool study um, published in Nature, I should look up the citation, showing that innovative sort of boundary-breaking science takes longer um, to pick up citations. And I think it's a good reason, I think we can assume that real data use, reuse also takes longer to show up in citation um, histories, you know, more than a year, which suggests that to your impact factor, even if you have data journals that allow traditional literature tracking citation, it, it's just going to be a really poor way to track data reuse and to give credit. So I think we need data citation. And um, the data publishers, there's a, a lot of talk now about publishers getting this right. I have to admit, at the moment, it's a bit of a chaotic situation. You also have Clarivit, Claire, um, who used to be Thomson Reuters, who has a data citation product, um, of which I know very little about the quality. Um, so I think the solution is going to be pretty soon, and it may take another five years. Um, journals are getting better and better at getting citations into the formal references, but the community needs to motivate authors to start putting this into their papers. Because journals are going to be poor at enforcing that, right? They may be able to say, here's the right format to use, but we need to get the community used to including the actual data identifiers in their manuscripts. And I think that there will be a much more open reference culture soon. This is already happening with, with um, Springer Nature and other big um, publishers releasing their references in a, a relatively open manner. So hopefully that will, you know, five years from now, we will be able to calculate really robust data reuse metrics, um, but at the moment it's a real challenge. Great, thanks. Um, how about for you, Meredith, so what would be the next step when, when these reuses happen and uh, researchers have derivative data sets? Um, how do you see the publication of those going and the linking between the, the two working? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, this particular example with um, the Anderson paper, they um, had in their uh, Royal Society paper, they didn't actually create a new data set for that particular article. So the data they had pointed back to the uh, scientific data paper, and they had a few images um, shared in the supplemental material. But I can imagine that the next piece he's working on, which will combine um, satellite data from NASA, might create a derivative data set. And that's one thing that our curators um, work on and continually talk about. In some cases, it's, it's somewhat complicated, but, but somewhat clear when you take two different data sets and create a new data set out of it, how to reference those and how to link all those back. But in other cases, no, not so much, especially when each data set has different um, licensing around them. So it can be a fairly ch challenging uh, question in terms of the right way to uh, reference 
new data sets. Um, but I think in, in these cases, for the most part, uh, you'll create a new data set, you'll um, deposit that in um, a repository such as Dryad, and you'll link out to your references and um, include a, 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 a robust readme file that can describe the processes of where you got your data and what you did with it to create your new data set. All right, any other questions from in the chat? I'd like to thank our speakers for that good panel discussion. Remind folks the annual report uh, should be visible to you in the resources tab. That'll also be um, available from uh, the Dryad website and the slides and the recording uh, of this session will also be available. So if you want to share this with colleagues, feel free. Um, there will be an upcoming election for new board members. So for members, I encourage you to keep an eye out for an email about uh, that soon. We need your we need your votes in that um, election. And uh, that's all I have. So I'll turn over to, to Meredith if there's anything else left to, to say. Thanks so much. Thanks, Todd. Um, no, I don't have much else to say except thank you all for joining. Thank you especially to Dryad members for your continued support and um, assistance on our governance. Uh, and as Todd said, be on the lookout for uh, ballots to come your way for the new board slate, which will be uh, later this month. And um, if anyone has any questions or feedback, I'll be sending out a survey asking for feedback uh, in a matter of a few days. So thank you again for joining. And uh, we'll look forward to you joining us on our next webinar, which is scheduled, will be scheduled in the fall um, on uh, some really interesting issues that we're working on. So thanks very much for joining us today.